uh, our speaker, uh, our fourth speaker in this session, uh, Thomas Bristol. So, so Professor Bristol is the director of the Institute of Science, Engineering and Public Policy affiliated with Portland State University in Oregon. Actually, his uh, honor thesis advisor, Paul Feyerand, at the University of California, Berkeley, pointed him to the University of London, where he studied history and philosophy of science under Imre Lakatos. So, uh, Thomas, please, the floor is yours. It works. It works. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I, I'm concerned with how the elements came to you. I have to say, big picture uh, uh, thing here. In uh, uh, so, uh, Eric wants me to. Uh, uh, talk I gave similar to this in Turin, and I never actually got to talk about the elements. So I'm going to tell you where I end up. Where I end up, and where I end up is uh, to say that the elements uh, were created. They are not just a, a modification of some underlying substrate. Uh, they're uh, they are uh, they can they are agents. They have agency. Uh, what does that mean? It means that they have internal energy and they're spontaneous. Uh, and finally, in the sort of Leibnizian uh, version, I want to say that they perceive, which simply says they're sensitive. Uh, one electron can sense another electron. That's not too difficult. And also, I want to say that they seek. In other words, that they don't just sit there. They're going to do something which is important to the idea of the chemical evolution of the universe. Uh, so that's where I'm going to go. So now, let's see if I can change this. What is it? That? No. How does it work to change? What? Just to the right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, these are my uh, my mentors and guys I work with, and they're all rebels uh, like I am. And I, I first went philosophy of science, and then I, I I didn't like philosophy of science. Well, I didn't like the scientific worldview simply because it's deterministic, and I didn't see myself in a deterministic world. And uh, and so gradually, I, I and, and the philosophy of science, the logical positivism didn't make any sense. So I gradually morphed over into what I'm calling philosophy of engineering. And so part of what I'm going to give you here is what I call an engineering view, thermodyna engineering thermodynamic view as it comes out of the creation of the elements. Uh, so this is sort of what we know. We know a lot about the creation of the elements now. Uh, we're learning more. Uh, gold and uh, uh, merging uh, uh, neutron stars and stuff, that's very nice. But it's the big picture that I am uh, concerned with. Uh, uh, and, and so I'm going to tell you uh, two stories uh, and, uh, and compare these stories. So the entropic story and the, and the anthropic story. Uh, okay, so I can do it. So, what do we know about, I mean, just basic about entropy. So if you have water uphill and the water flows down to the ocean so that the entropy increases and when the, uh, all the water is down at the bottom, at the ocean, the entropy is maximum. And uh, we say no work can be performed. That's great. Uh, how, did the, how did the water get up there? That's a problem. Uh, uh, Clausius and, and, and Boltzmann only have one way. One process goes down, that's all. So, and Thompson and Joule both worried a lot about how does the water get up there. And, uh, and, and Clausius is saying, he says, oh, what, you know, if you have hot and cold, it always uh, goes to this equilibrium. Great, so in, in the first case, how did the water get up there? In the Clausius case, how did we get hot and cold difference to begin with? If everything's flowing in one direction, uh, it's not clear how we got that uh, beginning. So this ends up being for, uh, okay, so let me let's see if I, I can't remember what the slides are here. Well, that's a little bit. So if we go to the Big Bang model, uh, this idea of getting the water up to the top is, is the same problem as how did I get a low entropy uh, origin, okay? so. Uh, there's no cycle there. We just, oh, we happen to be in a the universe. There's a low entropy origin, and, and then it all goes. So then this is like some uh, other problems occur in this entropic narrative. Uh, Stephen Weinberg's great book, uh, uh, 
uh, the first three minutes, goes on, tells us all these wonderful things. And the main thing I want to point out here is the symmetry breaking events, spontaneous symmetry breaking events. And uh, these are, I would say, mechanically discontinuous. In other words, you go from one order to another order and another order, and each order, each symmetry has an order and is a kind of a mechanical unit to itself, and, uh, and, and, and yet it goes from one to another. So uh, I think that's problematic. I think if I got this, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what I'm going to say is that so one way of, of characterizing this, this movement from the Big Bang is, well, energy, uh, we have we have two sets of energy. We have the, uh, the the quantity of energy is conserved, but the quality of the energy is uh, degenerates over time. And, and the quality is supposed to be the uh, the uh, uh, the entropy going down is uh, the quality of energy going down or entropy going up, quality going down. So I, I, and, and they say this is like well, the two aspects of energy. I'm not buying that. Uh, I think there are actually two definitions of energy and there's a lot of double talk going on. So the quantity of energy is always symmetric from the beginning all the way to the end. To say that it's conserved is to say that it's symmetric and it's always conserved. The other definition of energy being used is the entropic quality of energy thing. So uh, and, and we'll see the, the quality of energy is supposed to also be uh, the capacity to perform work. Okay, so when all the water is down, when the entropy is max, maximum, then we can no longer perform work. So the entropy is a stand-in for the idea of the capacity to perform work. Now, in, in uh, normal thermodynamics, in order to perform work, I need a gradient. Okay, I need a difference of some sort, of uh, potential. So on the one hand, the uh, quantity of energy has to be absolutely smooth and uniform and always that conserved and symmetric. The, the, the entropy type stuff is, is starts with a difference. So supposedly at the beginning of the, of the Big Bang or before the Big Bang, we have a commitment to symmetry and we have a commitment to the opposite, non-symmetry. Uh, it's a problem there. Okay, so, so we get these symmetry breaking events. The same thing is if your framework for your explanation of the big bang, of the whole evolution universe is mechanical, then you have no explanation of symmetry breaking events. I mean, he's a slam dunk right there. Uh, if your framework is, is mechanics, you have no uh, uh, explanation of mechanically discontinuous things going on, symmetry breaking. Okay, so then what happens? Oops, all these stars and galaxies and stuff form. But what's with that? Well, it's, it turns out so. In, in, in this nice symmetry thing going out, Bolson inversion, everything's nice. It's continuous increase, maybe a little probabilistic stuff going on, but uh, basically a, a massive increase in the entropy. Uh, but that's not what we actually observe. Oh, gravity. <laughs> did Boltzmann leave gravity out of this, this model? Yeah, he did. And there's been a lot of comment on this, but it's sort of one of those things that got swept under the carpet. So with gravity, we get stars, but we don't have any explanation of gravity, and it's certainly not part of the entropic uh, explanation coming from, uh, from Boltzmann. So uh, the, the next uh, fun thing that happens, so I'm going to say, so what we have here is very hot stars in a very cold universe, maybe 6,000 degree stars, take some of the outer uh, corona or something might be much harder, hotter than that. The very cold universe, two, three degree universe. That's a wonderful gradient. So what we've got here is the creation of an enormous number of gradients. I don't know. One interpretation of that is we've got an increase in our gradients, and we've got an increase, increase in the capacity to perform work, which is the opposite of what the entropic uh, model would have. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to say, if we, if we took a constructivist view of, of the universe, this is, this is just a violation of conservation. Uh, Okay, I'm going to come back to the elements. So the, the one thing I want to say about the elements, so the elements are created in the stars, more or less, we think. One version of the stars, collapsing stars, so forth. The important thing about the elements to me is their stability. You know, here they're, maybe they're, they're created in this high temperature, high uh, pressure, you know, supernova thing. You'll go out there into this cold space. Now, a simple version, I just expect them to fall apart. Okay, if they're, they, they needed this high pressure, high temperature to get together, and the high pressure, high temperature is gone, 
they're going to fall apart. But they don't. Okay. So the stability of the elements is, I think, another thing that is a, a big problem for the uh, for the entropic version. And uh, I think the entropic version in general has a problem with the formation of things, anything that's stable over time. I mean, that's not expected with just, you know, entropic thing. Okay, so more stars, uh, elements. Okay, so how are we going to solve this? We need a paradigm shift. And we need a paradigm shift to a post-scientific, I would say post-mechanical view of reality. I mean, there's just no way that this is going to work out in a mechanical uh, framework. Uh, so, there, there are a couple of uh, uh, stimuluses for thinking in terms of an anthropic version. One, it goes back to uh, the Timaeus and Plato and the, uh, the mind of the universe, so to speak, is, uh, is the architecton, which, uh, roughly speaking, is a master craftsman, is translated. She's an engineer. And uh, the other comes from quantum theory. Uh, now, quantum theory, usually everybody, oh yeah, quantum theory is a participant theory. You need an observer to collapse the wave function. Well, they weren't happy with that. And, or they were for a while, and some of them were. But uh, it, it, it goes on so that uh, really all you need is something that's going to perform work. And I would say perform work in an engineering sense, but that's a slightly bigger question. So uh, in order to class, so all you need is something that has agency. So if everything I already said, all these elements have agency, then they have not any problem collapsing the wave function in this model. So uh, John Wheeler uh, uh, has this wonderful uh, image of the, you know, we, we, we are the observing our, by observing we create the universe. We need to collapse the wave function, we need to actualize the potential. Otherwise just sitting there with a potential function, you got nothing. Uh, so it's, it's a very popular and it goes back and forth about who likes it, who doesn't like it. There's a wonderful article of, I uh, recommend Observership as Genesis where he goes into this and in, in, in a footnote to that he goes like, oh, and then someone came to me and said, you know, that everything I was saying had been said before by this German philosopher. I guess who it was? Schilling. Take that for what you want. So here's, uh, uh, Paul puts this very nicely. So in the new pattern of thought, we do not assume anyone with a detached observer occurring in idealizations of this classical type of theory, but an observer who by his in, uh, indeterminable effects creates a new situation theoretically described as a new stated observed system. Okay, so I'm in the system, I do, I make an observation to go to the next, okay. So roughly speaking, I'm going to suggest that complementarity is what forces us to a participant framework. Uh, okay, so according to quantum theory, how do systems evolve? Now, let's say I have a system, how does it evolve? Well, it doesn't evolve mechanically, okay? Because the quantum theory is a bigger tent. Quantum theory sees uh, Newtonian mechanics and Maxwellian mechanics as idealized cases. Okay? They're idealizations, they're not approximations, they're idealizations. So quantum theory is a bigger tent. It's not a mechanical theory. So what is it? Well, I want to say it's a thermodynamic theory, which I will come back to. Uh, oh, wait a minute. If it's a thermodynamic theory, aren't I back into mechanics? Aren't I saying that, uh, that uh, quantum theory is mechanics? Because thermodynamics is, is, you know, it's entropic, it's mechanical, according to Boltzmann. Uh, but, first of all, if you look at the back, uh, Planck's research in black body uh, uh, radiation, I would say it was an engineering thermodynamics research. First, clearly, it was thermodynamics. He was very, uh, wanted to refute Boltzmann and so forth. But uh, it was also, uh, his research was funded by the German electric light industry, who wanted a formula for optimization. They didn't want one optimization, but a formula. So they could say, if I have this energy in, I'm going to get these wavelengths out, this energy in, I'm going to get those wavelengths out, which is what he came up with. But it was engineering and thermodynamics research, not physics in that sense. OK, so uh, my problem, here's my uh, uh, Peter Atkins to the rescue. So it turns out that there are two theories of thermodynamics going around. Uh, Peter points out, he said that Carnot and Boltzmann have been in my thermodynamics. Carnot traveled toward thermodynamics from the engine, the, the symbol of industrial society. Boltzmann traveled to thermodynamics from the atom, um, the uh, symbol of emerging scientific fundamentalism. And then he says, thermodynamics still has both aspects. 
Well, I don't know. That was what I was taught. I was taught that you know Boltzmann was right, and and Carnot and Clark are some sort of historical footnote. Because no, they're both alive and well. You can think of this as open systems and closed systems, thermodynamics, if you like. Uh, and these are not compatible. Okay, you can't derive one from the other. They're just you know they don't they don't work together. Peter suggested at some point they might be complementary. I don't think that's uh, probably correct. Uh, I suggest that one has to be a special case within the other. Okay, one's a, an idealization within the other. Well, which, well I'm going to, my hypothesis in engineering thermodynamics is the more general version of thermodynamics. Boltzmann is just full of idealizations and left gravity out and so forth. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm going to skip over that about the symmetry. I highly recommend his most recent book. Uh, I don't know if skip over that. So, the other person, Don Cartwell, uh, is it, it was at the University of uh, Manchester, uh, which was sort of the seat of the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, and, and Cardwell picks up on this difference, and he goes like, wait a minute, what, what was the real history of thermodynamics? And, and he makes this comment, he says, accounts of the development of the concepts of work and energy have tended to describe them within the classical framework of Newtonian mechanics, mechanics generally. He said, I would like to suggest that this may be to take too narrow a view of the case. It's brilliant stuff if you want to read his books because he starts to see, what if he started looking at the history of engines? And he goes back, he goes back way before Carnot. Uh, he finds there's a guy in England, a guy Smeaton and uh, water wheels and looking at the efficiency of water wheels. There's a whole history that goes back, that opens up that we're not given because of the uh, Boltzmann overlay. Uh, this is my friend uh, Robert Ulanowicz. Uh, so we, I talk to him about this, and he goes like, oh, you're actually right about these. It took me, took me three years to convince myself that Peter was right, that there were actually two incompatible versions of thermodynamics going on. And uh, so Yolanda uh, uh, tells me, he says, when I was getting my PhD in chemical engineering at John Hopkins University, he said, in my PhD orals, I get the obligatory question about the dynamics. He said, if I'd said anything about entropy and particles and went around and stuff, he said, I would have been out on the street looking for a job in uh, real estate, selling real estate. Uh, he, was, he was educated by the engineers, okay, and not by the, uh, by the physicists. Okay, so this leads back, as you go back through this, I'm going to briefly, there's a lot on this, I'm going to go through it. So the hero in some of this, Sadi Carnot, you probably all know, wrote one, potentially the first book on, on uh, thermodynamics, looking at, uh, at the, uh, how the steam engine worked and so forth. Well, it turns out his father, Lazar Carnot, was a real genius. And uh, I'm in, involved in uh, translating some of Lazar's stuff. But Lazar takes, he says, you know, like, uh, he's an engineer, he says, like, I'm not happy with the fact that the, <laughs> the engineers are not don't seem to be part of the world, and engineering doesn't seem part of the world. He said, everybody knows that there's a trade-off between time, velocity, and power. You know, I can use pulleys, I can make it fast, I can do it. So he said, I look at all the physics versions, because of rational mechanics, he said, they don't seem to have any account of this. If take it further, they can't even make sense of the question, because the question has to do with my ability to approach a problem, to do something in different ways. So free will, if you like. So Lazar attempts to create an engineering uh, mechanics, which ends up turns out to be thermodynamics, which I won't go into here. Now, uh, one thing here, so the, the really important part of Saadi's work was this efficiency formula. And he says, well, uh, whenever something goes on, whenever there's an action, there's always a loss. I mean, whenever something goes on, there's always a loss. Okay, well, that's not mechanics. Okay, mechanics is just, it just, you know, like Newtonian, it just goes. Uh, and what he's saying is, no, actually, that's not the way change occurs. This is a new, this is a different theory of change. And he says there's always a loss. I mean, I think we all buy that, but that's uh, something that's important. And it's fundamental to engineering thermodynamics. So I have to, this is where you have to go here. So Carlos, this is a, this is a quote from from uh, Clausius, who manages to screw things up. So Carnot, he says, he quotes Carnot, or he's just quoting uh, Clausius. Carnot says expressly that no heat is lost in the production of work. That is, uh, that the quantity remains unchanged. And he adds, this is now he's quoting Carnot. 
this is a fact which has never been disputed. It is first assumed without investigation and then confirmed by various calimetric experiments. To deny it would be to reject the entire theory of heat of which it forms principal foundation. So that's Saudi's commit. Uh, Clausius says, I am not, however, sure that the assertion that, that in the production of work the loss of heat never occurs is sufficiently established by experiment. Perhaps contrary might have been asserted the greater justice. These guys are talking two different ideas. And there are two different concepts of work going on here. There's the mechanical work. The work that Saudi is concerned with is this work? No. No, but the work that Saudi is concerned with is the area within that uh, graph, okay? That's, that's the effect. And there's always cycles. Work is a result of a cycle. It's the net product of a cycle. Okay, the cycle keeps going on and there's something else that goes, goes out there. Okay, so, uh, but we knew, we knew that, uh, 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 you know, the mechanics was idealization. Maxwell, in this nice little book, uh, Matter of Motion, has you know, backward there, he, uh, he says, well, causality, you know, A to B, you know, cause and effect, so it goes on. He said, this is only true when small changes in the initial conditions do not result in large changes in the effect. So what he's saying is, the, when you actually see a, a, a you know, classical causal relationship, that's an ideal. That's not what actually happens, okay? So he's already way ahead. And of course, in uh, when chaos theory came out, this is my friend, uh, Ralph Abraham and, uh, you know, talked about Euclid's voyage into chaos. He just completely, chaos where it comes out, it completely undermines uh, mechanics and the logic that goes with it. So then, uh, I wanted to, you know, okay, so uh, again, not go through it. This goes back to the Prince of Least Action, and there's two versions of that. One goes to Lagrange, and one goes up through, uh, uh, from Montpertuis through Lazar, and Planck sees it. Uh, so, uh, t my conclusions here, just to repeat, uh, all the elements, they're creations, they're not modifications of an underlying substance, and I believe that the result of work, and I would call it engineering work, they're Leibnizian agents, in other words, they perceive, they can sense each other, and I say they see, that's a little tougher to understand, but it just means that it, the universe doesn't just just stay there, it goes somewhere, and the reason is that elements go somewhere, they, I would say, I am, I am a molecule here. I'm before I stand before you as a large molecule made up of, you know, periodic table. Uh, how did we get there? So, and and the engineering ontology is engines all the way down, and uh, it's a naturally evolving system. Okay, uh, one of my favorite chemists, inventive creative universe, uh, Ken Denby, who I'll men don't mention. It. Uh, anyway, that's it. Thank you. Applause. Thank you very much, Jerry. Very interesting views on thermodynamics of the uh, periodic table.